Good evening, one and all. Uh, this is Dr. Uh, Anil Tabawar Desai. I welcome each one of you on behalf of uh, Texo College to this international webinar. I would like to express sincere gratitude to Ms. Rushan Abbas for accepting our invitation. She has taken some time from her valuable some valuable time from her schedule. And uh, today's talk will be moderated by Dr. Ramu Longmay, HOD of uh, Department of Political Science. Now I request Dr. Ramu Longmay begin. Thank you, sir. Over to you, Dr. Ramu. Hmm. Uh, am I audible uh, in the first place, uh, Dr. Anni? Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, you're all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your um, in, uh, uh, intro, uh, introduction of our program today. Uh, I would like to say good evening, everyone, once again, uh, and welcome to international webinar uh, on the Uyghurs in crisis, forced labor, and genocide targeting women with uh, Ms. Rusen Abbas. Founder and Executive uh, Director of Campaign for Uyghurs. Uh, I am extremely happy to welcome uh, Ma'am uh, to our platform this uh, uh, this uh, this evening. And uh, before I go on to uh, talk about our honourable speaker this evening, I would like to mention you know a uh, few points about uh, what uh, our honourable speakers will be uh, speaking in this uh, session. So first, um, Ma'am uh, Rusan Abbas will share on the current uh, dire you know, situation uh, of the Uyghur people, including the ways that China's action constitute genocide. Number two, the program will also cover the returning normalization of slavery in the modern age through Uyghur forced labor. Number three, our honorable speaker will also speak on the on, on the Uyghur women and the problem the, the problems they face under the Chinese regime with the help of her personal experience based on the story of her own sister's abduct, abduction by the Chinese regime or authorities. Number four, our speaker will also speak on the complicity or involvement of Western countries and businesses. Number five, based on the United Nations Genocide Convention established in 1948, we will be coming to know through our speaker that genocide, the intentional action to destroy a people usually defined as an ethnic group national racial as or religious group in whole or in part is a serious issue not only in Xinjiang province in China but also everywhere in the world number six through this discussion all of us participants will have the opportunity to engage personally with the tangible steps that each one of us can take to end this rapidly escalating genocide in Xinjiang province of China, as well as other places in the world. With heart full of gratitude, I would like to now Talk, uh, mention about our speaker. I have collected six points about our speaker. Let me just uh, take, uh, have the opportunity to mention the six point. About the speaker, Ms. Rusen Abbas is the founder and executive director of Campaign for Uyghurs. She has been an activist since her days at university in East Pakistan where she was one of the organizers of the pro-democratic protests. 
since coming to the United States, she has been a tireless advocate for Uyghurs' rights. In 2017, she established the campaign for Uyghurs, CFU, which was founded to advocate for the human rights and democratic freedoms of Uyghurs and other Turkic peoples oppressed by the Chinese regime. In 2018, her own sister was abducted by the Chinese regime in retaliation for her activism or campaign movement. Today, Ms. Abbas, residing in Virginia, United States of America, continues to advocate for, her, for the release of her sister and also for the freedom of millions of other Uyghurs and is always available for you know big uh, uh, many platforms given uh, you know of universities and for many group of people which are considered as a big think tank so ma'am now without further ado i would like to give you know the time for your uh, sharing with us these problems this part of the world we are also hearing we are also you know going you know uh, uh, you know going through some of the you know uh, uh, news you know about the atrocities about the control and taking out taking taking away of the autonomy of the Uyghurs people in Xinjiang province but never before like today we will be hearing directly from you you know your experiences and then you know your movement for the people of this you know, uh, 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 Uyghurs in this province. So, ma'am, the floor is given to you. Over to Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, doctor, um, for um, that kind introduction and the, uh, giving me this opportunity to speak about uh, this um, unprecedented atrocity that uh, the Uyghurs are currently uh, facing. And the, thank you so much for all the uh, students and the uh, faculties for um, uh, giving your uh, time at this 5.30 in, in, in India right now, probably it's time for you to finish up and go home, but now we are going to sit here and listen to this uh, really, really sad and unfortunate situation that to genocide. So um, I hope that uh, what I'm going to share will uh, enlighten for you and beyond just the education. I hope that um, we will all be inspired to um, take greater action to um, end China's genocide against uh, the Uyghur people. This is 21st century and the China is conducting genocide in bright daylight against Uyghurs. And the, uh, I, I need your help. I need a young people like you to fight for our uh, world's bright future. So uh, my people, the Uyghurs, um, have lived in Central Asia for over 2,000 years, um, now uh, living in the, a part called Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region by the Chinese government. But in, uh, in reality, uh, it is a uh, occupied land, and the Xinjiang, the name itself given to us by the Chinese regime, uh, explains the, uh, the it, it means Xinjiang, which is new territory, that is a new territory for China. Uh, but just by looking at the name, you can tell. But we call it East Turkestan. Um, that is a geographic, symbolic, and a historical name as our ancestors established independent um, country in that name, East Turkestan, uh, in this century, actually. Um, uh, well, and in, uh, in, uh, you know, within the last uh, 100 years, uh, I meant the first one was 1933, the second one was 1944, but uh, they both were crashed and they are now Chinese Communist regime is um, controlling since 1949. So since the uh, uh, Communist uh, China's occupation in 1949, the government has uh, relentlessly destroyed Uyghur culture, Uyghur religion, Uyghur ethnicity, then Uyghurs have been persecuted under all kinds of different names in the 50s. Um, back in 1950s, they called, you know, nationalists. And then after that, during the Great Cultural Revolution, during the 60s, 
and the Uyghurs were uh, persecuted under the label of counter revolutionaries. And then later it was separatists, but following the 9-11 attacks in the United States, um, following the 9-11 tragedy, the Chinese uh, government rebranded their efforts as war on terror. Because we are Muslim, it's really easy to use religion and the, just the outlaw, all kind of uh, normal, just a simple normal practice of religion, they called all of them are illegal religious activities. So under that pretext, uh, Chinese government has um, conducted um, uh, basically uh, I mean, you know, it's not like uh, violating the basic rights, basic uh, living rights of the Uyghurs, but now it came to the point that it is an active genocide um, because uh, there is a uh, concentration camps being built now, holding more than 3 million innocent people that's not being charged. They are just taken there and also... Um, just the regular people like you and me um, living under the complete surveillance, 24 seven being surveillance by the Chinese regime. And the, uh, when the camp issue came up to the international community, the government has uh, uh, changed their narrative several times. Uh, first, at the beginning, they just flatly denied, said, nope, there's no such a thing. There is no any kind of internment is going on that doesn't exist but after the uh, satellite images and the proof came up and the uh, when there is you know no way that china can deny it then they said oh those are uh, re-education centers we are trying to uh, re-educate those Uyghurs uh, with uh, you know like um, uh, communist uh, ideologies and the uh, we try to make them to become better citizens. And then later, after a few months later, they changed narrative again. They called vocational training centers. But when you look at the uh, pictures of those, uh, you know, uh, pictures of those uh, concentration camps, it doesn't explain the guard towers, armed guards, and the um, also, um, you know, I'm going to show you some pictures and doesn't look like some sort of vocational training, but it reminds you of the uh, Nazi Germany's Holocaust. And also uh, a town called Hoten in the southern East Turkestan. Um, there was one, uh, like a pre prefecture, one town uh, ship had purchased like equipment for one camp only, one camp only, imagine that, um, like over 2,000 of pepper sprays and the uh, like uh, 1,500 handcuffs and the stun guns and the other materials that you use in the prison camps. So what kind of education place or vocational training you're supposed to teach those Uyghurs like job skills so they can get better jobs. You know, that uh, it's just uh, sickening when you look at those kind of, um, this is purchase order by the Chinese government, actually. Um, that's what they have purchased. So uh, basically, when uh, the Chinese ambassador to UK um, recently asked by a BBC reporter um, when he was confronted with the video footage of blindfolded Uyghurs being transported by train um, that, uh, you know, the images resembles oh, basically a Holocaust. He just sat there and denied. He just, you know, just flatly denied. Um, well, Furthermore, you know, when the Chinese government is giving this narrative to the world that, uh, oh, we are just trying to help these Uyghurs get better jobs. They have targeted most of the Uyghur elites, like the famous writers, professors, university presidents, scholars, medical doctors, successful business people. 
and famous actors and singers. And there are elderly and young children and none of whom need a job. Um, so this is basically a lie when you um, look at the reality. And the, the camps, not just the holding millions of people there, but these Uyghurs in the camps also being used as slaves while they are working on production to advance China's economic aggression to the world. The first concentration camp um, in our homeland was built under a strike hard campaign in 2014. And the size of the camps grown over 500% in the last two years. So according to the news accounts and the uh, government bids for construction and the job announcements, the Chinese government is building crematoriums uh, by those concentration camps. We are Uyghurs, we, are, we, we Uyghur people are Muslims and they, we don't practice cremation. So why are they building crematorias next to the concentration camps for Uyghur people who doesn't practice cremation? So that should, you know, um, create a big, uh, uh, you know, like screaming from the world community if anybody wants in anybody cares for what is happening on their watch in 2020, 21st century, you know, their history is repeating itself and China's getting away with it. Just a, a couple months ago, the uh, US Customs and Border Control seized certain tons of human here that had been produced from Uyghur slaves. Imagine that. I'm not talking about some heavy, you know, like books or metal or something, hair. 13 tons, imagine that. How many Uyghur lives does that represent? Is this a hair of my sister? You know, it's my sister's hair is also in, in those uh, 13 tons that made it over to US to, uh, as a, like a wigs as a production to sell in US. And yes, you heard me right. Um, my own sister was taken to concentration camps um, as a retaliation for my activism here in America as an American citizen. I spoke at uh, one of the uh, think tanks here in Washington on September 5th, 2018. And uh, I talked about uh, the conditions of the camps and the dire situation that we were start facing while outlining disappearance of my husband's entire family. Six days after my speech, my sister just disappeared. She got abducted um, by the uh, government on the bright daylight. So of course, this is a punishment for my activism so whatever I'm speaking here is very, very personal to me because I am doing this in past two years at the great cause, at the freedom of my own sister. So last week marked two years anniversary of my sister's abduction. She is a retired medical doctor. She speaks fluent Chinese. She does not need any kind of vocational training to get a job. At the age 58, she retired in early age because of the medical reasons. But now for past two years, we get absolutely no information on her whereabouts or if uh, where she's being held, what is her uh, health situation. We have no info. So, to think about what this evil regime is doing to my sister and the millions more, those millions of Uyghurs, fuels to my strings to fight even harder. Every time when I think about my sister, when I look at her picture, when I see her face in front of my eyes, I recharge myself to fight harder. 
we must recognize China's crimes for what they are doing, genocide. So I'm going to explain a little more um, why I call this genocide. So when I talk about genocide here, think about China is hosting the 2022 Winter Olympics. Basically, China is getting rewarded by hosting Olympic Games while committing genocide with racial motivations, racial target to Uyghurs because of their race and religion. The US government and the civil society and the countries around the world, like use yourself, I count on you to do not make this happen. Need to write to International Olympic Committee, take all the steps and the actions we can to pressure the international communities and the, uh, ask them to contact the Olympic Committee to do not allow China host Olympics because this is not just being a bystander to China's genocide. The Olympic Committee is basically being complicit in, in genocide, supporting the genocide. So basically, the dignity of the international community and the, uh, the principles of the International Olympic Committee are being tested here. While undermining the rule of law and the international norms, China is the last country in the world to fit to carry on the Olympic legacy and to host the international games. So what is, internet, what, what is Olympic games when you look at it, you know? That is the people from around the world coming together from different race, different religion, different culture, coming from all over the world together, celebrate in the name of this game. This is a very prestigious game, but we shouldn't allow a country committing genocide against the Uyghurs because of our race, because of the language we speak, because of the ethnic differences, the ethnic identity we have, and because of the religion that we practice. The International Olympic Committee must acknowledge that moving forward with Beijing 2022 Winter Olympics is supporting the genocide. Remember, we have read in the history books that the 1938 Munich Olympics, Adolf Hitler announced the opening of the Olympic Games while he was conducting Holocaust and the genocide. Unless if we stop the International Olympic Committee to continue with Beijing 2022 Olympics, we will be sadly going to watch Xi Jinping, the monster that is basically killing millions of people and the conducting genocide is going to announce this Olympic in front of entire world community on our watch. So, uh, during this pandemic that was brought to the world by this totalitarian regime, China's actions to deny, keep quiet, misinform, punish the whistleblowers, and create a security crackdown are what made this virus from Wuhan a pandemic, just a, 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 a epidemic in one city. Now it's the global pandemic that we are all facing today. We are watching, again, hundreds of thousands of people dying because of this. And this situation, this pandemic, has resulted in increased uh, attention on China and their actions to conceal, deceive, and bribe in order to avoid any responsibility. However, requests for transparency has been continually met with threats and the so-called wolf diplomacy approaches from China, as the Chinese government has continued to wage an intense campaign of 
this information, the uh, Beijing regime has continually focused on the failure of the free democracies to contain the virus rather than their own failures to warn citizens around the world. At present, today, the Chinese government is testing medications and the vaccines on Uyghurs who have been locked without food and the, uh, without any help, you know. This is, I'm talking about the regular people like you and me. Uh, because of COVID, they were locked down and they are being used as a guinea pigs. Chinese government is testing their vaccines on these people. If those vaccines come up at the cost of millions of Uyghurs, imagine the whole world community is, again, um, you know, supporting China's economy by buying those vaccines to save lives. And the China is also using this pandemic times to bring Uyghurs to China proper, where uh, the epicenters of those viruses, to work as slaves. The Uyghur youth were sent to reopen those factories. And because uh, you know, the um, lockdown, the, the, the company, companies got shut down. So the Uyghur, Uyghur slaves on the 21st century is basically continuing to, the, to become victims of China's aggression for the uh, economy and the, the world domination. Well, with that, you know, with uh, the Uyghurs are literally becoming slaves, many of the companies around the world that many famous names that we know are benefiting from this slavery. The brands, as you know, as Adidas, Nike, Zara, Gap, Volkswagen, BMW, Calvin Klein, and many, many more. After my uh, speech, I'm going to give a PowerPoint presentation and show you all these names. While the West is uh, reeling from the continuing effects of the uh, racial injustice and while they are rightfully addressing these and the international community largely ignoring the literal slavery that continues to produce our clothes on our back and the, the goods that we use every day. While all this occurring, millions of Han Chinese so-called settlers have been brought to our homeland, East Turkestan, lured with promises of homes, free education, free health care, financial subsidies, preferred treatments for jobs. And the Chinese government is claiming that those Uyghurs are brought to China proper because of the unemployment, because they cannot find jobs, so they can have a better jobs in China proper. So basically everything China is telling, China is saying is complete lies. As uh, China continues to aggressively extend its reach across the globe, the rightful inhabitants of East Turkestan have been imprisoned so that the majority Han Chinese can get away with their um, in any way they want, including with our Uyghur women. The Uyghur girls are forced to marry Han Chinese and they cannot refuse such a forced marriage because if they say no, then they are being viewed as the Uyghur Muslim girls didn't want to marry non-Muslim Chinese and she will be uh, viewed as Islamic extremist or radicalized Muslim and will sent to concentration camp. Imagine that, you know, something like this is happening in 2020. Something like this is happening in front of everybody's watch here. Basically, China started the uh, genocide from the Urumqi massacre in 2009. But when you search the internet, we saw how China twisted the narratives 
to distort the images of the peaceful demonstration of the Uyghurs, while just like they denied the, uh, the Tiananmen Square massacre. And the, uh, if you remember what happened in Hong Kong last year, how the peaceful protesters were met with brutal Chinese police, same thing in Urumqi in 2009, while the international community still calls it the riots, Urumqi riots. It was not riots by the Uyghurs. It was brutal execution by the Han Chinese police against the Uyghur people. And now with Hong Kong and the Tibet and the, uh, what the Chinese government is doing to Southern Mongolia, how many times must the Chinese regime show its true colors to the world before the world community wake up? We have the last opportunity to do so, but unfortunately, this last chance at accountability for the Chinese government is quickly slipping away if we stand still like this, because we are still confronted by a muted world. The entire the ethnic group, the entire Uyghur nation is becoming collateral damage for short-term politics and the economy. So are we going to take tangible action and stand for its highest ideals for human dignity and freedom? When you, you know, when you, we do need to see some tangible actions against China's crimes. Recent Disney Mulan movie that released its uh, live action uh, uh, version of Mulan. It seems like a harmless movie, right? But the reality is the true malice is hidden in the details when they thank the beloved Disney, thank the Turpan Security Bureau who is conducting, who is complicit with those concentration camps. And yet they hired um, the movie's uh, star, uh, Liu Yifei, who made comments supporting China's police in the uh, brutality in Hong Kong, Hong Kong police's brutality against the pro-democracy protesters. So basically even um, Disney is being complicit. So, you know, what is happening here when you look at it? Basically, China is buying the compliances of the world community, the compliances of uh, NBA, Hollywood celebrities, compliances of uh, Disney, the UN, the International uh, Organs the Organization for Islamic Cooperation, the uh, IOC, International Olympic Committee, the basically China's blood money. Um, bringing this, uh, you know, actions and the making a genocide like uh, a general thing, you know, like uh, you can support, anybody can support it. So everything what's happening recently in East Turkestan meets the definition of genocide listed in the uh, Convention on the Prevention and the Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, signed in 1948. And China is one of the signatories too. The region has hundreds of examples of facts that constitute a genocide. There's five elements, like killing members of the group, causing serious bodily mental harm to members of group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions for calculated to bring uh, about its physical destruction in a whole or part, and of, uh, imposing measures intent to prevent childbirth. If one of these five facts happens, you can call it genocide. You're supposed to determine the atrocity determination, the genocide determination. But now all five is happening. Why UN is not taking any steps? Not only that, China is invited to be on the UN Security Council panel. Imagine that. 
Imagine inviting the killer, the murderer, to judge its own trial. Because of China's money, China's blood money, China's second largest donor in the United Nations, the UN is basically becoming inactive. The yes, China is trying to silence all the international communities, but they cannot silence us. And I would like to know that they cannot silence you as the youth, you are the future of this world. So the history will remember the upstanders, and I trust every one of you will become upstanders. And that the history will condemn those who fail to stand for what's right in the face of this evil regime. Do not allow for the threats and the bullies that they are doing. We must act now before the only voice speak, only voice left to speak is one of regret. I'm going to share my screen now to show you um, some of the visuals, some of the pictures, of what I just talked here. Can you see my screen? Yes, Rushan, we can. Okay, so um, as you see, this picture is not from the World War II. This picture is not from Nazis Holocaust. This picture is Uyghur people and Radio Free Asia did a wonderful job um, basically identifying some of these Uyghurs. There are people, you know, among these faces, the guy sitting here at the front, he's a teacher in high school, and one is the successful businessman, and another one is a shop owner in Hotan. So all these people had lives, had wonderful job, but they are in the concentration camps like that. See those armed guards? See those double-wired fences? So this is the picture from one of the camps. The East Turkestan, as I mentioned, the population, the Chinese um, numbers, Chinese uh, census shows 12 million, but the Uyghur census show over 20 million, um, as you see where it's located in the heart of Central Asia. And natural resources, one third of China's natural gas and the oil reserves and 40% of coal reserves comes from our homeland. And the many um, precious um, minerals and the metals such as uranium and the gold and the jade and it produces 84% of China's cotton output. So imagine every cotton uh, item that you purchase or everything basically made in China is involved with Uyghur slave laborers. And some of the pictures of uh, current, uh, this is just the regular everyday lives of the people. Look at that. This is like a war zone. And that's some of the pictures from inside of the camps. Look at those pictures, face, those uh, people's faces. Those are fathers, husbands, brothers. They have a name. They have jobs. They have families. And those pictures are witnesses actually released from the camps, and they are testifying what's happening inside of the camps. They were being released only because either they were married to foreign citizens or they are foreign citizens. None of the Uyghurs, none of the Uyghurs who actually carried Chinese passport or Chinese citizens are being released. And that's my sister. And she's missing for two years. And she has two daughters, both live in the United States. And her daughters, even them, they cannot get any information on their mother's whereabouts. So why all this happening? Why China is all of a sudden doing this to Uyghur people? The Chinese Belt and Road Initiative 
one belt, one road, it also calls, or it's also called as a new Silk Road or 21st uh, Grand Strategy. This is Xi Jinping's blueprint for the world domination. Basically, when you look at the map I showed you earlier, this China's new Silk Road plan puts our homeland, East Turkestan, in epicenter like a gateway, you know, China's gateway to Central Asia, to Africa, to Europe, to Middle East. So everywhere they go with this, uh, like uh, the plan for the world domination is starting or going through our homeland. So Belt and Road Initiative covers over 700 projects, four to eight trillion dollars investments. That includes infrastructure, airport, highways, railroads, bridges, seaports. And when those people in those countries signing up for Belt and Road Initiative, they thought that they are getting benefit from this because of China's investment. No, China's bringing Chinese workers with the projects. So this is a way of colonizing those countries. So imagine all these countries. In all Central Asian states, Pakistan, Afghanistan, all Southeast Asian states, what's going to happen? Just to look at Uyghurs today and imagine the future of those countries, because China is basically occupying those countries through this Belt and Road Initiative plan. At the end of the game, with all this, there will be one winner and one loser, like all the games. China will be the winner. Whoever naively think that they are benefiting from China's Belt and Road Initiative, they will become China's colonized countries, like colonies, China's colonies, like the East Turkestan, like the Uyghurs. And this is one of the uh, camps. Picture here on 2015, there was just a big open land and now the camp being built there is almost as big as the entire town of Dabanjing. And the, uh, the one on the left was watchtowers. And some of the pictures, the one, the picture on the top is 2016 and how fast it grew in uh, 2018, how they doubled and tripled. And what kind of thing is make you target in China to uh, send you to concentration camps, having a beard or having a hair up or speaking your native language or uh, refraining somebody from smoking or drinking, wearing a shirt with Arabic uh, words on it, using WhatsApp, if you have a WhatsApp on your phone, going to mosque and praying, traveling to abroad. Basically, those are the reasons all these innocent people are sent to concentration camps and work as slaves. This is a before and after picture in famous place in uh, Kuchar, Kusan um, Pass. Um, the one on the left, the place like uh, Times Square in New York. Just imagine, you know, in your country, this most famous place that people come all day, they hang in there. You know, these Uyghur people used to come once sunrise, spend all day there selling uh, whatever the harvest items they have or, uh, you know, uh, do their business or chat and have dinner and then go back at their sun, sun uh, set. And look at this on the right, it's hardly anybody right now. What happened to all these people? And the picture on the left is a uh, airport in Kashkar. They have a special dedicated line for human organ transport. So that shows that those camps also using for forced organ harvesting. And the, the Chinese government is actually uh, advertising in the Muslim countries that uh, they have halal organs. Imagine that, you know, the, the Uyghur people are Muslims. In Muslim, in our religion, they don't donate body parts. Um, it's against our religion. So where does those halal organs come from? They don't grow on the trees. 
they are talking about double lungs and hearts and the kidneys. As I mentioned, the forced marriage of the Uyghur women. Look at these girls' faces. Do they look like that uh, this is the happiest day in their lives? A girl getting married to who she chooses to, who she loves? That is what we call it marriage. But if the girl cannot deny who she doesn't want to marry or she cannot choose who she wants to marry, what is that? That is a rape of the Uyghur women in the name of sham marriages. And this is the humiliation the Uyghurs are facing on the streets. If their shirts are a little bit long, that's being viewed as Islamic, uh, illegal Islamic clothing. And if they refuse to get their clothes cut off on the streets, they will send to the concentration camps and being viewed as radicalized Muslim or terrorist suspects. Under the double relative program, those are pictures from the Chinese media itself. 1.1 million Han Chinese officials sent to Uyghur homes to live inside of their houses and to supervise their daily lives. Most of the Uyghur men are sent to concentration camps or the prisons or the forced labor facilities as slaves, the Uyghur women are subject to sexual abuse by those Chinese officials because they are sharing beds with them, sleeping in their houses. This is the largest government-sponsored mass rape that Chinese government is conducting. I'm going to play this uh, video for you. This is actually a video clip that was uh, posted all over the uh, social media in China. Those three Chinese men on the left lying with the one Uyghur woman and she has a baby in her arm. So what's going to happen to that woman at night? Imagine that. Anybody with a heart and a soul should not be quiet after watching something like this. Uyghur children, over 500,000 Uyghur children are abducted. Those are the uh, normal Uyghur children's face. Look at them, they are happy, they are satisfied. Um, content, you know, they have a happy face because they are living with their parents. Look at them now. The one on the right, that is one of the government run, state run orphanages. It's like a prison camp. They are taken, forcefully taken from their parents and sent to run, you know, the orphanages. And they are being brainwashed. They are forsaking their ethnic identity and religion. The end of last year, in December 2019, the Chinese government announced that, oh, all these Uyghur people are graduated. We don't have anybody in the camps anymore. Well, nobody heard from their relatives. My husband's entire family is still missing. All these Uyghurs in diaspora, everybody has their mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, their relatives, they're still missing. So where are they? Where did they go to when they graduated from the camps, if they have graduated? Then spring this year, Australian Strategic Policy Institute released a report, Uyghurs for sale. Yes, you read that right, Uyghurs for sale, on your watch. In the 21st century, the slavery is going on. If you search internet Uyghurs for sale, you will read this report. Look at all these world brand names. 83 Western brands are complicit with using Uyghur slaves in their supply chain, where the Chinese camp companies are selling them per head like, you know, there are some uh, ads that we have seen 
is like 100 Uyghur people and coming with uh, two police officers. This is not something coming from some movies or you are just reading some fiction books. These are the reality. So where is my sister, Dr. Gulshan Abbas? She's not famous. She's not outspoken. She's just a retired medical doctor. So who is, you know, who is benefiting from my sister's slave labor? You know, who is, um, which uh, company's supply chain is using my sister? Who's benefiting or profiting from her slave labor? So those are the pictures, as you see, these Uyghur youth has face masks. They are sent to China proper to work as slaves while everybody was sitting at home, avoiding to uh, going outside with social distancing, try to save their lives from this China's uh, Chinese government's uh, pandemic that they created. Okay, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our organization. So we uh, established Campaign for Uyghurs about three years ago, the end of 2017. And the, our goal is raising awareness and try to educate people, work with grassroots organizations, work with youth like yourself to make a change, to save this world from this totalitarian regime. And it, defend the freedom and the democracy we all worked so hard for past 100 years, past 50 years. So what you can do, there are some steps I'm going to um, uh, quickly uh, mention here. You know, just basically say no to anything that's made in China and the, uh, share information, what you heard, or follow us on social media. Our Campaign for Uyghurs has a website and YouTube, and the, we are on the Reddit and the Pinterest. If you search for Campaign for Uyghurs, you will find. And in Instagram and the Twitter, follow us, share our information, be the voice for those millions of voiceless, defenseless people. Thank you so much. And I'm here to answer any questions you have. Oh, thank you very much, ma'am, uh, for your very insightful and uh, it was uh, really, uh, it was indeed a heart-wrenching, you know, first-hand uh, accounts of the ill-treatment, brutality, you know, uh, torture, sexual abuses, and all kinds of discri uh, discrimination which you put it in one word, genocide, against, you know, the uh, Uyghurs community over there. Uh, as I already pointed out uh, at the beginning of a session that uh, someone, you know, working for the Uyghurs, knowing the problem is sharing with us today. So I hope just like me, uh, our participants are richly, you know, uh, benefited and uh, rich information we are drawing, you know, from our sharing, you know, by honorable speaker this, up, uh, this evening. So uh, now I would like to open up the floor for Q&A session. So I think uh, I would like to request uh, their participant to kindly, you know, either you put out in, in, in the chat box or you can unmute your microphone and then directly, you know, put your question in short. So the floor is open for you. And uh, before uh, anyone do that, I uh, just want to inform you that I will be also sharing uh, the feedback link uh, uh, prepared by our Tetsu College and uh, which will have to be filled up by all the participants in few minutes time. So I will do that after some time. So let's now go in for, you know, the Q&A session. The floor is open up now. Uh, ha hello, ma'am. Uh, good evening. And uh, I'm very happy to join this seminar. Myself, Vijaya. Uh, I have uh, done my doctoral thesis on Uyghurs 
ethnicity and nationalism in China and it is uh, particularly related to Uyghur community of Xinjiang even my dissertation is uh, on that and it's very agonizing to hear your personal account as well as while I am uh, working on my research uh, to uh, going through all the things such a rich uh, it is rich civilization and finally China has a nation state we have to see it here as a nation state not as a country uh, claiming over the land claiming people uh, abduct, uh, abducting them all these uh, committing human rights violations genocides and finally framing it as uh, terrorism uh, or fundamentalism so uh, I, i'm really uh, like uh, i want i regret myself during my uh, for my thesis i couldn't meet any of the ugur scholars uh, uh, or activists although i got um, ma'am are you part of world ugur or organize uh, congress or uh, it's an independent uh, uh, one campaign for ugurs uh, you please let me know this and i'm um, um, it's really like you have given a full account of that and i'm sorry to hear that you you are also victim of the china, china regime and it is happening all over the world this human right violations against the minorities uh, especially ethnic minorities religious minorities it is happening uh, just not uh, just everyone who is educated uh, they have to do their uh, turn by uh, like you said to give up the things uh, which are produced through forced labor and all thank you ma'am if i have any thank further more queries i will just contact you through your mail id thank you ma'am thank you so much vijaya uh, thank you for yeah. your effort uh, we are campaign for Uyghurs is an independent organization but uh, uh, we work very closely with the, with the world Uyghur congress um, the president of the world Uyghur congress Dulkun Isa is a long time friend of mine we started our activism together when we were at the university back in East Turkestan when we were only 18 years old so um, uh, world Uyghur congress is umbrella organization and they, uh, we do work very closely with them. And if you have any further uh, requests, feel free to contact us on our website, www.campaignfolders.org. And also, um, all the other students and everybody is listening, and the, uh, when you record and they put this uh, uh, session on YouTube, I encourage you to go to our website, and on the bottom, on the uh, right-hand side, there is a sign-up, uh, a, a place you can enter your email address and sign up for our mailing list. So we usually um, send out press releases and the, uh, any information update you with uh, like a current uh, information and affairs. So I encourage all of you to go to our website and sign up uh, for our mailing list and also follow us on social media. Thank you. And they, uh, thank you, uh, Dara, um, uh, one of our uh, directors from our organization, just to put up on the chat a petition for my sister. My sister's daughter, my niece, Ziba, created this uh, petition for my sister. So if you go to change.org and they, uh, search for Gulshan Abbas or just click on the uh, right-hand side here that uh, there is a link to sign a petition to release my sister. I really appreciate if you could do that and share that information on your social media, share this petition and send to your friends and colleagues. Thank you. Okay, ma'am, uh, I think I could see one, you know, uh, question uh, on, the, in, uh, on the chat box. So can I just read out for you? Yes, please. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, accord, uh, according to media reports, the U.S. is uh, considering implementing sanctions against China for the treatment of Uyghurs. Is this a result of the return of Washington to a policy of defense of human rights, or is it related to U.S.-China threat confrontations? Could you address to this question? Uh, 
Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, many people are politicizing the, the Uyghur issue and the, uh, the genocide. Uh, they are trying to use this against the you know, uh, US or uh, US government and they um, try to say that uh, this is uh, because of the relationship between China and the US and they, um, they are using Uyghur issue. No, what you have heard, this is a tragedy. This is a human rights issue. This is not a political issue. So anybody who's doing anything is only because they want to do the right thing. They want to end this, this uh, evil system and end this genocide and end the concentration camps and release people like my sister. So please, you know, anybody who has that kind of question about uh, this is some sort of internal, uh, like uh, China and the uh, U.S. problems, do not believe that if anybody tells you that. Because did, did you just saw the pictures, you just listened to how I talk. This is real. This is not just a, some sort of political issue. Um, the U.S. is standing up for China because I think, I believe, U.S. is strong enough economically so they don't have to worry for what they lose by uh, getting China upset by speaking against it. So that's why I said for many other countries who are staying silent, they are making the Uyghurs a collateral damage, human collaterals for their economic benefits with China. Not because that uh, they didn't know what's happening. Nobody can claim that ignorance. Just like Nazi Germany back in 30s, when 1933, Nazi Germany opened the first concentration camps, the world knew what Germany was doing. Germany was announcing to the world what they were going to do with Jewish people. But they continued, they continued to doing business with China, enabling China's economy to murder more people. After 12 years, when the Nazi Germany unconditionally surrendered, there were more than 6 million Jewish lives were claimed. For what? Because the world, they turned blind eye. They failed to take action because they only thought of their short-term economy, their own interest. And then later they claimed that they didn't know it because information flow was slow and they, they didn't know what Nazi Germany was doing well. They cannot claim that ignorance anymore. This is information era. You Google Uyghur, you see everything. You search for Uyghur, you read everything. So you cannot, any country cannot claim that ignorance that they did 75 years ago. So if the countries don't take action, like United States taking against China, because they are being selfish, because they are selling their conscience to China's blood money. Thank you so much. That was a great answer, a great uh, question that I get to say this that I forgot to mention during my comments. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Uh, the answer was also very great. And it was a great answer to that question. Great question. Uh, as I told you earlier that uh, your testimony today has, in fact, you know, the power to galvanize, you know, uh, all of us and uh, slowly and gradually the entire world. And I strongly believe because, uh, as I said, that uh, it was a heart-wrenching first-hand information or account on this. And um, we have an international community to look into it. And just want to uh, inform you that we have uh, in the past, because history is the witness uh, you know, of the past you know, genocide. We have the Holocaust case. We have the Armenian genocide. We have the Iraqi genocide. We have the Cambodian genocide. And... Uh, Rwandan, you know, uh, genocide and now genocide case in uh, Xinjiang province of China. So I think this is the newest, you know, uh, you know, area where we uh, we can think of, you know, how genocide is uh, repeatedly happening over there. So uh, you have given a big account of that, and then I think many of us are learning so much, you know, from this session. Now I would like to go to one of my colleagues, you know, is uh, 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 giving solidarity with you. And also, uh, is that uh, do the way 
uh, all face the same atrocities like those of the Uyghurs in China. So can you just kindly uh, briefly answer this? Thank you. Yes, uh, China's, uh, thank you so much, doctor. Um, China started with the, the, the Uyghur uh, Muslims and the, uh, uh, they basically uh, use the religion to conduct genocide, but uh, actually in reality, they are not only eradicating the Uyghur people, but they are also waging a war on Islam. So eventually, after uh, the concentration camps and after this uh, brutalities in Uyghur region against the religion, using the religion and the demolishing the mosques, changing the mosques to entertainment centers or bars, um, and the uh, uh, burning the Holy Quran, and also um, uh, not allowing anybody to fast or forcing Uyghurs to eat uh, alcohol, I mean, eat pork and they, uh, drink alcohol. But now they are eventually expanding that to Hui Muslims as well. Um, we are being told and we are seeing the Imams getting, getting arrested and also um, uh, the, the Hui Muslims uh, also uh, uh, facing a restriction going to mosques and also the mosques are being uh, demolished uh, in the Hui area as well. Just a, a few days ago, actually, I saw one of the Bitter Winter article and they put um, like the Arabic writing on the top of the houses or top of the mosque um, in a Hui area that's being removed now. So eventually it's getting there. China is using what they are doing with the Uyghurs as the testing the water as a pilot program, and they are expanding to other regions. So my uh, message to Muslim people, Muslim countries, and the Muslim leaders, if they don't watch and they don't speak up and they don't defend Islam, don't do it for the Uyghur people, but do it for Islam. If they don't speak up and they take action against China, the Uyghurs today will be the future of those Muslim countries as well, because China views religion, any religion, as a threat to communist atheist ideology. Um, any kind of original thought or any kind of uh, the, the power beyond the communist party that uh, we believe, that we believe in Allah or uh, other people call their God in different names, they're all being threat to communist ideology. They're all being threat to communist party. So eventually, step by step, little by little, the Chinese government is going to eliminate them. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for that wonderful response. And before we go uh, on to the next question, I, re I would like to just point out one thing, because you mentioned one thing that the bigger case in China is just a tasting water sort of thing you were mentioning. So uh, as we all know that in China, Uyghurs is only one of the 56 you know, ethnic minorities in China, present China. So altogether around you know, 56 my, my, uh, ethnic minorities groups are in China. So you are mentioned, now we also touch upon the Uyghur uh, community also. So um, we are really like afraid that, you know, diners, you know, as you have mentioned uh, clearly that, you know, the, the fire, you know, the, the case of uh, brutality, the case of that, uh, what, what do I say, sort of like a concentration of those people who are not, you know, coming, uh, to, coming to the mainstream, to join the mainstream would be put to test. So we are afraid of that. And that is also giving us another worry. Yes, as we have seen, Uyghur is only one of the 56 ethnic minorities in China. Now, I would like to uh, go to the uh, next question. The uh, Harsh uh, Chattabhadi has asked, uh, put forward there. And uh, his question is uh, whether Chinese government policy in Xinjiang against Uyghurs uh, are similar to policies of China towards Tibet or against Buddhism. So. Uh, can you just see the? Uh, can you just tell us the connection? Um, just to uh, you know, uh, mention that uh, yes, there are fifty-six. Uh, um, China claims to have fifty-six uh, uh, different ethnic groups in China, 
um, they call it minorities and uh, uh, we refuse to accept that word because we are not minorities in our own homeland, we are the majority. But um, uh, all these 56 uh, uh, different ethnic groups, at once they all had their own language and culture and the history and the, their ethnic identity. But when you look at it, now it's only Tibetans and the, the Uyghurs and the, uh, the Kazakh, Kyrgyz, the, you know, 13 um, uh, ethnic groups in East Turkestan, um, just the, and the Southern Mongolians. It's just a handful of people left with their own ethnic identity or language. Every, everybody else get assimilated to Han Chinese. They speak Han Chinese, they look like Han Chinese, and they lost everything. They lost their ethnic identity, their language, their culture, their history. Uh, became uh, just like a, you know, they have the name maybe, but they became like Han Chinese. So that's what they are trying to do. If you have watched the news, recent crackdown on the language for the Southern Mongolians, and that's how it starts. With your language, first your language. That's what they did 20 years ago with our language. Um, once they take your language away from you, then little by little you lose your uh, ethnic identity. And uh, to answer that question about um, if China is cracking down and the Christians and the Buddhism and the Jews, yes, yes, absolutely. All this underground Christian, like Christianity is not something that they can openly practice. Um, they're like just to, to avoid international pressure. China may be like showing off some set up staged places. Oh yes, we allow them to uh, practice. But how? Practice with communist ideologies because China is openly announcing to the world on their media they are rewriting the Bible and the Holy Quran to make it compatible with Chinese ideologies. How? How in the world Christianity or Bible or Islam or Holy Quran, how can the Bible and the Quran be written and modified to fit a communist atheist ideologies. That's impossible. But openly China's announcing to the world and nobody is saying we're doing anything. You know why? Again, it comes down to China's blood money. So the China's setting the next world order. China's ruling and China's uh, undermining the rule of law, China is basically taking away everybody's religious rights, waging a war on Islam. But where are the Muslims? Where are the, uh, the international community? Where are the Christianities? Where is the Vatican? Where is everybody else? So basically, when the perpetrator is China, the perpetrator can lie, perpetrator can bully. So are we all going to just let them get away with this? Over. Yeah, uh, ma'am, very, very, uh, very, uh, very good uh, response to our question, uh, which uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Ani, uh, is also putting forward about Christianity in China. So your response, uh, perhaps, you know, over, you know, as, uh, as I uh, uh, listen to you, I have uh, noted that, you know, in China, there is religious persecution, you know, not only in the case of Uyghurs community, but also other, you know, religion. So I think our participants uh, are perhaps interested to know about, you know, uh, what is the conditions of Buddhism and what is the condition of Christianity. So your response perhaps, you know, cover it very well. So we will end it in uh, eight minutes, uh, five to six minutes time now. And I would like to, you know, uh, request uh, other participants to kindly put forward the query. Uh, when ma'am is available with us now, and we will try to wrap up, you know, our sessions in 10 minutes time. All right, uh, quickly one question. So, came up here uh, by Sir S. Krishnan. Since the 90s, uh, Uyghurs have had a protector 
in Turkey than in Pakistan. While the organization of Islamic cooperation is also in this direction, but if I am not mistaken, we are witnessing now to a lack of coordination and reactions, you know, of Muslims, you know, communities or countries in defense of the Uyghurs uh, in China. Why is that happening? Is that uh, is it in China uh, because of uh, China's huge economic power, which is blocking, you know, uh, what do you call a concerted, you know, uh, uh, encounter, you know, from the Muslim communities uh, in 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 uh, supporting the Uyghurs in China. So, what is your response, ma'am, to that question? Yes, uh, that's absolutely correct. Um, uh, the Organization for Islamic Cooperation, when they first heard what is happening to Uyghur people. Um, they released a statement criticizing China in the end of uh, 2018, actually, uh, when the camp issue came up. But uh, right after they released the statement, rightfully, you know, they're supposed to, because that's the um, Muslim organization supposed to uh, protect the Muslims' uh, benefits, you know, defend Islam, defend Muslims. But right after that statement was being released, um, just a couple months later, China sent uh, 20 people delegation to Abu Dhabi, and the, uh, we don't know what kind what kind of deals they offered and the, uh, how they uh, uh, bought uh, the, their uh, uh, rights and they got away uh, with what they wanted to get away. But uh, very disappointingly, uh, the Organization for Islamic Corporation uh, released a statement, not not for this statement, I'm sorry, they passed a resolution. Imagine that something like this never happened. They have never done something like that. They passed a resolution in the spring of 2019 commending the Chinese government to continue what they are doing in Eastern Pakistan against the Uyghur people. So um, basically, uh, China is you know, bullied or uh, bribed or whatever they did. Uh, they completely changed uh, uh, the attitude of organization for Islamic cooperation. And ever since then, they have been quiet. Um, that really disappoints us because um, in our religion, um, the, the Hadith, um, the Islamic uh, Brotherhood states that all Muslims in the world are like uh, the whole body and one part gets limp, you know, one part gets hurt. The entire body is supposed to react is a fever. Um, but the Uyghur Muslims are being amputated from that body today. Where is the reaction of our Islamic Ummah? Um, I, again, you know, I think uh, the main reason is because uh, China is spreading false narratives and false propagandas and the all Muslim countries and Muslim leaders and the Muslim Ummah are becoming victims of China's uh, false narratives because they are saying that, oh, we are training these people to get jobs and we are helping with unemployment, the economy, and that we are uh, uh, just dealing with radicalized Muslims like everybody else. So we are the victim, you know, China is trying to play himself as the victim of Islamic terrorism. So I think, um, you know, that's what I wanted to believe because I know if Muslim people, my Muslim brothers and sisters, and the Muslim majority countries, and those leaders in the Islamic world and the uh, organization, the Islamic Corporation, only if they know the reality, only if they know what is happening, what China is doing, they are not going to leave us alone. I believe in that. So that's why sharing this information is so important, uh, raising awareness, on the social media, in the media. And the, that's why I appreciate this session um, and you uh, uh, putting this on YouTube because more people know about this, more Muslims learn. I'm sure they will talk to their leaders. I'm sure they will approach their governments, those Muslim majority countries to take action against the enemy of Islam, against the enemy of the Muslims, which is the brutal Chinese communist regime. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, ma'am. Um, we will uh, now take up uh, altogether two questions. Uh, 
uh, one of the question is being put forward by my student, our student. So uh, it is a very important, uh, uh, important, you know, uh, things to remember that one, one of our students is also, you know, asking uh, a very important question to you. So I would like to just put before you the two questions. You can kindly uh, take it up, these two questions together. And, uh, and after these two questions, if there are, uh, uh, there is no more question, then we'll try to wrap up. And uh, I would like to now, uh, you know, uh, let you know the questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, what are the demands of the Uyghurs right, uh, uh, right now? What are, what are the demands, you know, of the Uyghur community in China now? And uh, also, uh, what are the Uyghur community, what are, what is Uyghur community really, you know, expecting from you, uh, UN, India, and other countries, you know, uh, to, to the problem of the uh, Uyghur community in China. That is the first part. The second part is uh, by, my, by our student, and uh, he want to know that uh, all those ethnic groups in China, living in China, uh, is there any possibility all, for all of them to come together uh, to to you know uh, to put a uh, what you call a front you know against the Chinese you know atrocities uh, meted out to them. So is there any possibility of the, the minority communities yeah. you know of putting you know a combined uh, you know a combined force against the Chinese? So these are the two questions, ma'am. You can address. Thank you. Um, well. What do we demand from UN, India, and the other countries of the world? Uh, hello, ma'am. We couldn't hear you. Well, we, yeah. Yes. Um, hello. Yeah. I, I'm going to. I'm going to address all that. Yes. Um, so, what do we demand from UN or India or other our, countries? Our participants, is it uh, audible? Need... Audible to you? I'm sorry. Dr. Ani, is it audible? Um, I'm getting. You know, your voice is getting cut off. But um, yes, I think, uh, yeah, I think the questions are clear. Let me just address it. Um, so what do we want from the UN and the international communities? We want them to uphold the principles and the, uh, you know, why, why they are there. Why, what are the, uh, the base for their existence? They're supposed to protect the nations under uh, the immediate danger, like uh, the Uyghur people are facing genocide. The, uh, the UN and the India and the other countries should speak up and they should take action against China, cut all kind of, uh, I mean, cut any economic relationship with China because buying China, Chinese goods or dealing with China for the independent countries is supporting genocide. So stop any kind of business activities, um, the pool, the, uh, the, the unplug the, the, the lifeline for China. Um, and the, uh, the, what the, uh, the Uyghur movement want, well, we trusted the Chinese government, our people trusted back home for 71 years, the thinking that the, the Chinese government, when they, when they came in, um, they said that we are here to only develop the area and help you to become uh, economically independent, then we are going to live. Just like what they are doing in, in Africa, in the Middle Eastern countries, and the Pakistan, and the, all other countries in Central Asia. Oh, we are just helping. We are helping with Belt and Road Initiative. That's how they came into us. 71 years ago, when they occupied, they did not say that we are going to kill all of you. We are going to take your country, take your resources, and they uh, eradicate your people. They never say that because this is not a regime that practices with how you and I respect the uh, principles in life. They act with lying, bullying, and the uh, undermining. So what they did to us made everybody feel that unless if we gain our own freedom and independence, there's no way that we can continue live like this under China. So yes, we want our freedom and the independence of the East Turkestan. We want to reestablish that independence 
we had once before. We were an independent country. East Turkestan established two independent republics. So we want to reestablish that. Um, yes, we do uh, work with all um, the persecuted uh, ethnic, ethnic groups together, like Tibetans, Southern Mongolians, Hong Kongers, and the Taiwanese. And on October 1st, the establishment day of the People's Republic of China, we are calling for Action Day, Global Action Day. If you Google Resist China or Global Action Day, you will see this. Um, we are calling all the people in the world resist China and protest that day. On October 1st, we have a protest organized for more than 100 countries. So please, as the youth, as the university students, join us. Protest that day with the, uh, the hashtag resist China and the uh, call, you know, the international communities to take action against China. So yes, they answer that question. We do work together. So I'm going to, I think uh, there's no more questions. So I'm going to just uh, um, finish up here with uh, saying, there was a vow never again, you know, in uh, after the World War II. Never again means we will never allow another atrocity like what happened in the Holocaust. But Holocaust is happening on your eyes. The genocide is happening on your watch. So please take action. And the actually, the, the vow never again follows with actual action. It means nothing. It's just two words, means nothing, represent nothing. So make that powerful word, powerful promise never again, actually effective by taking action and never allow another genocide continue. Thank you. I think the connection is getting pretty poor. Okay, is Dr. Ani here? There's a connectivity issue from my end. I hope I'm audible now. Yeah, I think uh, the connection is getting bad, and they are. Uh, thank you so much for everybody for listening. I really appreciate your support, and the, uh, uh, I trust that uh, you will not just listen, but you will take action. Thank you. Okay. Um, we, we, if I, on behalf of Ketchup College and all the participants, uh, I would like to thank you know our wonderful speaker. Thank you, ma'am, so very much for your insightful and. Uh, Okay. Uh, we are very, you know, of the, you know, uh, problem of the leaders in the, in China and the human rights issue is not trying to one community. So we all are very happy that you know whenever human rights issues uh, arose or problem is, then we should all join our hands together and fight. You know, till you know we all human beings fight, identify and, and uh, like so. Not only uh, this is the problem of the Muslim community, but also it is common all the uh, women, the groups, and communities. So yeah. I am so praying much. that you know the whole. Thank you, Dr. Whole will join hands together in fighting against uh, uh, violation of human rights. Yeah. Thank, okay, thank you. Thank you so Dr. very much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Longmei. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, ma'am. And I. Wish success in your in, in your campaign and we all will also you know uh, will continue to support for human rights. Thank you everyone for joining with us. Thank you. Thank you everyone.